गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन सो लेट्स स्टार्ट द क्लास फॉर टुडे एंड टुडे आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट रेस्पिरेटरी सिस्टम डिसऑर्डर्स इन केस ऑफ चिल्ड्रन दैट इज निमोनिया आई डू दिस फर्स्ट एंड इफ टाइम इज देयर फॉर अस देन आई विल स्टार्ट ब्रोंकियोलाइटिस एज वेल लेट्स स्टार्ट द टॉपिक नाउ निमोनिया ओके निमोनिया इज वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इलनेस इन चिल्ड्रन any age group in pediatric uh, you know can suffer from pneumonia and whenever you visit any pediatric hospital any pediatric ward in a big hospital there are lots and lots of cases of pneumonia especially in winter season but it can occur in other season as well so pneumonia is defined as inflammation of lung parenchyma leading to consolidation so this is also known as pneumonitis inflammation of lung parenchyma which leads to consolidation it's called pneumonia and the part of the lung which is distal to the terminal bronchiole is affected this is known as acinus of the lung so that area is affected in case of pneumonia so the affected part are respiratory bronchiole alveolar duct alveolar sac and the alveoli isn't it remember these are the areas which are also affected in emphysema but that disease is completely different from pneumonia pneumonia is infectious illness there is inflammation of the parenchyma as part of the lung which leads to consolidation consolidation means solidification of that part of the lung now before we move further let's talk about some of the terminologies some of the terminology in case of pneumonia bronco pneumonia lobar pneumonia persistent pneumonia and recurrent pneumonia so what are the meaning so bronco pneumonia is a primarily spreading inflammation of the terminal bronchiole and their related alveoli so bronchiole that is terminal bronchiole and the related area is mainly affected and it is a patchy type of inflammation or patchy type or spreading type of inflammation bronco pneumonia here and there not uniformly uh, in one area but here and there are patchy type of involvement whereas lobar pneumonia is one or more lobes of that lung is involved now if we talk about right lung there are three lobes and in case of left lung there are two so either one of that lobe or you know most area of that lobe uniformly involved or all of the uh, lobes can be involved so definition can be different thing in lobar pneumonia the alveolar ear has been completely replaced by cellular exudate and in pathology if you remember we have studied about the different stages of lobar pneumonia the first stage is called stage of exudation okay also known as congestion second red hepatization third gray hepatization and the last one is called resolution so what does that mean that alveolar space okay is filled by exudate in the stage of congestion it is converted into some solidified structure like red hepatization in that stage it will change its color into gray but it's still solid that is gray hepatization and ultimately all that uh, you know thing would go back to the normal that is resolution so this is lobar pneumonia persistent pneumonia is persistent sub symptoms and x ray abnormalities for more than one month if everything remains for more than one month that is persistent type of pneumonia means longer you know pneumonia long longer lip persistent pneumonia like if some symptoms are there for example even after the treatment of the patient patient has taken antibiotic but does not completely resolve uh, there are many reason behind it the antibiotic may not be appropriate uh, whatever the doctor has ordered patient has not taken it so all those things may be there and recurrent pneumonia it is defined as two episodes of pneumonia in one year or more than three episodes at any time with radiographic clearance between the two episode of the illness So let me clarify again two episodes of pneumonia in one year or more than three episodes at any time 
with radiographic clearance between the two episodes of illness. So one episode of pneumonia has completely resolved both clinically as well as radiologically and it has come back again, okay, again. And the important point is the chest X-ray should be absolutely normal before the another episode occurs. This is recurrent pneumonia. Now let me say a little bit about this before I move further. Recurrent pneumonia, okay? recurrent pneumonia is commonly caused by some predisposing factor. One of the important predisposing factor or condition is immunodeficiency disorder. If that child is immunodeficient, then several episodes of pneumonia can occur in the children. Another one is congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease, which has left to right shunt. Left to right shunt. Now, uh, every student know about those example, VSD, ASD, PDA, and endocardial cushion defect. These are the important example. Now what happened in them? A lot of blood is flowing towards the lung. Okay. And during that situation, the secondary bacterial infection is very common. The third important predisposing condition for recurrent pneumonia is a one type of tracheoesophageal fistula. And that is called H-type tracheoesophageal fistula. H-type. Probably in case of you know pathology, we have studied this long time ago. Okay, H type of uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, which is not very common and very difficult to diagnose also because time and again slight amount of aspiration can occur uh, from that fistula and recurrent pneumonia can happen. So I listed three important uh, causes or predisposing condition for recurrent pneumonia. One immunodeficiency condition, second, left to right shunt type of congenital heart disease, and third is tracheoesophageal fistula, which is H type. Now, after knowing this, you know, uh, introductory slide, let's talk about what are the causes or etiology of pneumonia in children. See here. Actually, the etiology differs according to the age group. Streptococcus pneumonia or pneumococci, pneumophilus influenza type B, and Staphylococcus aureus are the pyogenic bacteria that most commonly cause pneumonia in children. Okay, so if we combine all type of age group except neonate, then these are the commonest organisms. Mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia are the most common cause of atypical pneumonia in children. Now, the earlier organism which we talked are the causes of community acquired typical pneumonia, and these are the cause of atypical pneumonia. Now, why the term atypical pneumonia is given there? Because of the sign and symptom. The sign and symptoms are completely different from the typical bacterial pneumonia means they don't have uh, you know increased fever uh, or they don't have fever at all the cough is very troublesome here in a typical type okay and the most important point patient doesn't look very sick that's why it is also known as walking pneumonia it is quite common in the age group of 5 to 15 years okay and also at the age group of 1 to 3 months there is a very dry hacking type of cough in this atypical pneumonia and uh, fever is not commonly seen. Even sputum production is not common in this condition. Now, see there, this table is very important. A lot of questions can be asked from here. According to the age group, what are the common causative agent? Now, see here, in neonate, Group B streptococci or GBS, also known as Streptococcus agalactiae, E. coli, Klebsiella, Listeria, and Staph aureus are the common organism. But among them, if I choose which are even more common, these are GBS, E. coli, and Listeria. Okay, they are far more common than other. Among the viruses, 
cytomegalovirus and herpes virus cytomegalo and the herpes and others are chlamydia chlamydia pneumonia or uh, chlamydia trachomatis now one important point i like to highlight here there are two types of infection in the neonate one is called early onset and another is called late onset now early onset uh, pneumonia or sepsis is caused by these organisms which are mainly derived from maternal genital tract there is a direct connection with maternal genital tract and the early infection in the neonate never forget this whereas late onset pneumonia or sepsis occurs after 7 days of life okay after that newborn become 1 week old then after that if sepsis or pneumonia occurs we call it late onset sepsis even meningitis can occur uh, during that time and the organism may be this may be this or may be a uh, somewhat different like staph aureus now which is very common type of organism during that time okay or different gram negatives may come into the picture so this is the meaning in 1 to 3 month old child strep pneumonia staph aureus okay and haemophilus influenza are the common bacteria and these are the common viruses cytomegalovirus okay now rsv respiratory syncytial virus influenza and para influenza and from the others is chlamydia now this chlamydia is also a type of bacteria you may be wondering why this chlamydia is not written here because this this others organism which are written here are the important causative agent of atypical pneumonia it looks completely different than this typical bacterial infection that's why though they are bacteria they are written separately this respiratory syncytial virus is a common cause of bronchiolitis okay in case of children very small babies are affected and this para influenza virus commonly causes a disease okay a disease known as croup croup syndrome or acute laryngotracheobronchitis but at the same time they can also lead pneumonia from 4 month to 5 years age strep pneumonia a pneumococci staph aureus haemophilus influenza group a streptococci and mycobacterium tuberculosis can lead pneumonia so most of the organisms are same here and uh, on the viral side it is rsv a respiratory syncytial virus adenovirus and influenza virus and now mycoplasma is the important organism in this age group now when the child become older than 5 years okay uh, then pneumococci staph aureus haemophilus influenza and mycobacterium tuberculosis similar type of organism which we have just seen influenza and varicella from the viral side varicella is a positive organism of chicken pox one of the complication of chicken pox is pneumonia that's why it is mentioned here and mycoplasma legionella species and even moraxella catarrhalis okay moraxella catarrhalis they can also lead to some atypical type of symptoms so these are uh, some of the important causative agent now let's move further let's talk about what is the pathogenesis of pneumonia how pneumonia occurs in this age group now in children pneumonia is invariably preceded by viral infection now see here in children pneumonia is invariably preceded by viral infection so what does that mean in the beginning the upper respiratory tract infection would occur urti we say which is very common in children any age group so they manifest like mild grade fever or low grade fever okay runny nose moist eye okay? they become irritable they have a slight amount of sore throat and mild cough these are the important point now what happens this viral infection they disturb the defense mechanism of the airway or the lung the cilia which are present on the airway are damaged by this viral infection the epithelium are damaged 
So as a result of that, the innate immunity would become weak, isn't it? This is the innate immunity would become weak. Even, even the alveolar macrophages, which are present inside the alveoli, their functions are altered because of this a viral infection. Now what happens if all these things are happening? Then secondary bacterial infections are very common there now because of the alteration in immunity and because of disturbance of the innate immune system. Innate immune system. So that exactly happens. Now let me give you one clinical scenario so that you will understand it very easily. A two-year-old child, okay, a two-year-old child. develop mild grade fever develop mild grade fever okay, runny nose moist eye and mild degree of cough parents are not that you know concerned about this they just give paracetamol give a lot of uh, you know oral liquid or oral fluid and uh, took care of the child at home after 3 days okay after 3 days the child suddenly become more sick the fever become high grade Okay, fever become high grade. The child started to cough more than before. The child started to breathe faster than before, and the child even started to vomit. Now, at this time, okay, we should understand this child is secondarily infected by the bacteria. Earlier, probably the child was having viral infection, but right now the secondary bacterial infection has occurred. So this is a very good history you should ask to the parent. how high was the fever in the beginning okay did you measure the fever you should ask this question and after few days what happened to the fever did it still remain the same or it increase what is the condition of the child in the in the difference of 2 to 3 days if you ask question like this then definitely even before examination of the child you can suspect yes this child may be having bacterial pneumonia now another important point this microorganism they gain access to the lung by the hematogenous dissemination or local spread which they descend through the respiratory bronchial tree so from the upper part of the airway they go distally towards the lung or they may reach the lung through blood through the hematogenous dissemination now the same question again i have discussed this point so many times in different infectious disease how the bacteria reach the blood from other infective sources in the body like skin infection abscess urinary tract infection like pyelonephritis osteomyelitis gi infection these are the very important sources now after knowing okay after knowing this pathogenesis let's talk about the clinical features of pneumonia if you know this clinical feature <clears throat> you can diagnose pneumonia even without investigation now in the clinical practice pneumonia is diagnosed by faster breathing and difficulty breathing remember two points faster breathing and difficulty to breathe now rapid respiration has acceptable sensitivity for the diagnosis of pneumonia and the rapid respiration for the diagnosis of pneumonia is according to the age group at this point you know i have been uh, you know teaching you from the last semester during our practical sessions as well in less than 2 month old age group the respiration should be less than 60 if it is more than 60 then it is abnormal so even even the newborn baby has respiration less than 60 up to 2 month okay should be less than 60 from 2 month to 12 month it should be less than 50 in normal babies but if it is more than 50 it is tachypnea or faster breathing and from 1 to 5 year it is more than 40 then it is abnormal in normal baby should be less than 40 this is very very important point and after that slowly it will become like an adult okay it takes time though apart from this faster breathing the child is having high grade fever in typical bacterial pneumonia 
chest pain when the child cough the small baby they cannot complain chest pain they may just cry okay they may just cry but older baby they will complain that fever may occur with chills and rigor if it is a lobar type of pneumonia very common symptom chills and rigor with fever high grade fever in lobar pneumonia cough okay with sputum production now a small baby they don't produce the sputum because they swallow it okay? though the sputum comes out with the cough they swallow it and sometimes they vomit it out okay? but older children they may produce the sputum and if we examine that okay usually it is purulent or sometimes it is mixed with blood purulent and sometimes it is mixed with blood so these are some of the very important point and regarding the breathing difficulty regarding the breathing difficulty so how we how we find it out the child is having breathing difficulty this is known by respiratory distress and the signs of respiratory distress would be there like the child is using accessory muscles of respiration sternocleidomastoid trapezius intercostal muscles anterior abdominal wall muscles and all those now let's continue sometime the child may present with acute abdominal emergency due to referred pain from the pleura now this is highly confusing even for the doctors who are working in emergency department because whenever some child comes with acute abdominal pain we think about acute abdomen means the pain has originated from the abdomen and we take certain history and we do examination and investigation related with the abdomen only now we completely forget about the chest or the lung but please remember that if the child is there with high grade fever and cough don't only focus on abdominal condition even if the child presents with abdominal pain it may be a referred pain from the lung or the pleura it is a embarrassing situation if somebody else diagnoses pneumonia and you cannot because uh, pneumonia is very easy diagnosis sputum is sometimes blood stain i already talked about this may be known as rusty sputum in case of lobar pneumonia and in severe case the signs of a respiratory distress appear like nasal flaring in a very small baby grunting in drawing of the chest even cyanosis and unable to drink cyanosis is considered a very late already it is a sign of respiratory failure and unable to drink very sick baby the baby even cannot suck mother's milk or even cannot drink this is a very sick baby and we have to uh, admit this baby in the hospital Now, let's move further let's talk about what are the peculiarities of pneumonia in the newborn period now newborn are special age group in case of pediatrics they have so many things which are different so sign and symptoms of pneumonia may also be different in them there is absence of cough or fever in the newborn they just breathe faster that is probably the most important point apart from them they don't cough or they don't develop fever they rather develop apnea okay apnea apnea is cessation of breathing or respiration for more than 20 second or sometimes they may stop breathing for probably 10 second or 15 second and if it is associated with bradycardia pallor okay pallor bradycardia or even decrease muscle tone then also we call it apnea grunting is very common especially in the neonate grunting now grunting is a grunt sound a sound which the baby produce when the baby inspire during inspiration this sound is produced okay now there is a proper mechanism for grunting this grunting develops because of partial closure of the vocal cord when the baby breathe and that partial closure of the vocal cord is to maintain enough pressure inside the lung so that those alveoli remain open we should 
those alveoli should remain open then only aeration occur inside them right if they uh, remain closed or if they remain collapsed then the baby will be severely hypoxic so you already understood what i am explaining here grunting is quite a common feature in case of hyaline membrane disease okay or respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity but it is also commonly seen in pneumonia in neonatal pneumonia rapid clinical deterioration now you have just seen the baby few hours ago and the baby was having good movement okay baby was quite active and alert and within the space of few hours the baby is very sick the baby has developed shock okay so this this exactly what happens in the neonate or the newborn we don't have enough time to revive them they don't have good immunity to fight against that sepsis they can rapidly deteriorate cyanosis can occur okay cyanosis they become blue very easily okay. they quickly develop septicemia and septic shock and these are the features of septicemia abdominal distension altered sensorium and even bleeding tendency now this abdominal distension is a very common feature of neonatal sepsis very common okay altered sensorium because the infection has grown, gone into the brain and bleeding tendency this is because of dic disseminated intravascular coagulation dic very very important one and this altered sensorium can also be explained by hypoxia because this is the case of pneumonia both infection as well as hypoxia bronco pneumonia is more common than lobar pneumonia in case of newborn and if i want to compare between bronco and lobar pneumonia bronco pneumonia is considered more serious illness than lobar pneumonia so these are some of the peculiarities of pneumonia in the newborn and these are very uh, important points for you once we start working in neonatal unit now let's diagnose pneumonia let's talk about how to diagnose it now diagnosis always include history taking physical examination and investigation so let's start with some history point the, the baby may present with cough or faster breathing that is the complaint from the parent side and they say this just happened 3 days ago and you ask is fever there or not and they say yes did you measure the fever yes doctor we measure it and it is 39 degree centigrade so you don't need any other thing to suspect pneumonia this is a case of pneumonia now you should find out what type of pneumonia is this okay which organism have probably caused the pneumonia and how you are going to manage it so these are other steps Now see there, one of the important investigation is complete blood count. We always do this, and uh, in case of a typical bacterial or typical community acquired bacterial pneumonia, there is neutrophilia with increased WBC count. Neutrophilia with increased WBC count. We always do chest X-ray, okay? And chest X-ray will show a lot of features. Now chest X-ray. may show low bar consolidation one whole lobe may be affected or it may show patchy type of consolidation so this is low bar pneumonia and bronco pneumonia if there is acute low bar pneumonia you consider pneumococci as the causative agent because this is the most common bacteria which leads to low bar pneumonia but not always okay not always sometimes even klebsiella can cause low bar pneumonia right upper lobe pneumonia if there it is present we can suspect aspiration especially in neonate and infant because aspiration is quite common in them during feeding that can easily happen upper lobe pneumonia with cavitation can occur in tuberculosis now this is not primary pulmonary tb this is secondary tuberculosis or post primary tuberculosis so it occurs in older children because very small baby or younger children if it is occurring for the first time that cavitation never occurs usually gone complex is the feature of primary pulmonary tuberculosis recurrent right middle lobe pneumonitis 
if it is there we consider partial bronchial obstruction due to gland and others like foreign body and this uh, gland means lymph node lymph node enlargement and this lymph node enlargement is very commonly done by tuberculosis again in this age group foreign body is another important differential diagnosis now in chest x ray if there is multiple abscesses multiple abscesses on either lung or one lung then we think of staphylococcal or klebsiella pneumonia mainly staphylococcal staphylococcus aureus is a highly virulent organism it can lead to pneumatocele in the beginning and later on uh, they may complicate into lung abscess now viral pneumonia are usually interstitial type of pneumonia interstitial pneumonia or interstitial pneumonitis and usually they are bilateral and viral pneumonia is never as serious as the bacterial one just the symptomatic and supportive treatment is necessary in viral pneumonia but remember one thing you cannot you know dismiss this baby you cannot say oh this baby doesn't have bacterial pneumonia so let's not admit this baby in the hospital okay don't say like that and don't do like that as well this baby may be hypoxic so we need we need to give oxygen to this baby the baby may be having fever so hospital management is done but we don't need to give antibiotic usually now in case of mycoplasma pneumoniae a type of atypical bacteria okay cold agglutinin are present in the peripheral blood okay. this cold agglutinin okay can be igg or igm igg or igm now what are these actually the igm type of auto antibodies that agglutinate patient's own red cell are called cold agglutinin and they usually react at very low temperature around 4 degree centigrade so that's why they are called cold agglutinin and they are mainly igm type igm type this is very important question which can be asked to in different exam there are some other causes of cold agglutinin or cold antibody like lymphoma remember lymphoma even if strain bar virus infection can be some other cause now if pneumonia is caused by myco you know mycobacterium tuberculosis though we use the term tuberculosis commonly than pneumonia in this setting but the pathology which is developed inside the lung is still pneumonia or pneumonic consolidation but the causative organism is different it is tubercul bacilli this time so how you can from the diagnosis student can answer this easily the diagnosis is made by the help of mantu test okay mantu test uh, in case of tuberculosis this mantu test may be strongly positive until and unless the child is immunocompromised or in case of severe type of uh, tuberculosis like miliary tb it may be absent a smear and culture of the sputum can be done but in very small baby uh, the collection of the sample is a, a tricky situation okay so we uh, insert the ng tube and then take that gastric content uh, through the ng tube okay, centrifuge it and use that sample uh, for the lab so this is what we do in case of small baby because they they swallow the sputum so whatever uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is present in the sputum it is still there inside the stomach and many of the time you can culture that uh, you know specimen and culture is done in algae media in case of tuberculosis it takes almost 6 week for the growth of the organism in rare instances invasive procedures such as bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavas even lung aspiration or lung biopsy may be needed and these are uh, never done in the beginning right so if our diagnosis is a real challenge we could not diagnose earlier 
then these types of uh, procedures should be done. So these are last resort of investigation. Now let's talk about the differential diagnosis of pneumonia. Means what are the other illness which may uh, present with sign and symptoms just like pneumonia? Bronchiolitis, who is associated lower respiratory tract infection, okay, who is associated lower respiratory tract infection, aspiration of foreign body, congestive heart failure, and atelectasis. So these are some of the common condition. Now a uh, few points about each of them. Bronchiolitis is caused by viruses. It is mainly caused by viruses. So it can be easily confused with viral pneumonia, but still there are some important point. In bronchiolitis, wheezing is more common than crackles or crepitation. Okay, and chest X-ray will separate these two. In pneumonia, there is patchy type of consolidation here and there. In bronchiolitis, we don't see those type of features. Wheeze associated low respiratory tract infection. There is predominance of wheeze rather than crackle. In aspiration of foreign body, there is a typical history, heart failure, many different clinical features, and okay. So let's restart again. We are talking about the differential diagnosis of pneumonia in infant. The first of them is bronchiolitis. A lot of the clinical features are same, but in bronchial bronchiolitis, there is more wheeze than the crackles. And chest X-ray is a very important way to differentiate these two. There is one condition known as wheeze-associated low respiratory tract infection. There is predominance of wheeze rather than crackles here. And later on, this type of baby may develop repeated reactive airway disease. Third one is aspiration of foreign body, one of the important differential diagnoses of pneumonia. But only one side is affected rather than both here. Okay. And there is a good, uh, you know, history. Maybe uh, sometime when we feed that baby, uh, something must have choked or aspirated. Congestive heart failure. There is no fever. Okay, absolutely no fever, uh, and more of crackles than wheezes. And chest X-ray again differentiate these two things. Atelectasis means this is a collapse. It looks very different from pneumonia. Let's move on. From the older, in older children, what are the differential diagnosis now? Acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis. Now bronchiectasis is permanent dilation of bronchi and the main cause is infection. And remember one thing, this bronchiectasis patient can also have repeated exacerbation. Okay, means this chronic disease may, you know, have acute exacerbation time and again. So they may exactly present like pneumonia. But how to differentiate that? Okay, we take chest X-ray, we do CBC count, and uh, that will clearly tell us there are some honeycomb appearance inside the lung, which is seen in bronchiectasis. And top of that, uh, now this is acute exacerbation. So chest X-ray is the main thing here. Endobronchial TB, one type of tuberculosis which develops inside the bronchi, it may obstruct there that and can have a wheezing type of you know noise upper lobe pneumonia can present as meningismus important point here meningismus means there is neck rigidity but that that neck rigidity is not caused by meningitis okay listen once again there is neck rigidity but it is not caused by meningitis so what is the cause then this is one of the cause, upper lobe pneumonia. Some other cause may be acute tonsillitis, okay? acute tonsillitis, which can lead to uh, enlargement of tonsillar group of lymph node. And whatever inflammation or infection occurs on the neck area, which can irritate those muscles, that can lead to spasm of the neck muscle, and that is known as meningismus. So this is the tom. The tom is important here. So all neck rigidity cases are not caused by meningitis. Now, lower lobe pneumonia can present as acute abdomen. Okay, I already discussed this 
okay in today's topic this is one of the way of presentation of lower lobe pneumonia and many of the time the doctors who are working in emergency room they confuse with acute abdominal condition like appendicitis okay like cholecystitis like pancreatitis okay so we should be careful one chest x ray okay should be taken and that will give you the diagnosis usually accompanying ileus with absent bowel sound may mimic acute appendicitis so we already talked about that okay this ileus ileus means paralytic ileus during this time the contraction of the bowel is lost the peristaltic movement is lost that can happen with sepsis okay which is caused by pneumonia and it can easily get confused again with intra abdominal pathology like appendicitis let's move on what are the clinical features which assist in etiological diagnosis now it depends on the causative organisms if pneumococci is the causative agent there will be lobar or segmental consolidation lobar is more important here and there are three lobes on the right lung and two lobes on the left lung so all of those three lobes or one of those three lobe or major part of that lobe can also be consolidated group a streptococci is another bacteria which can lead to pneumonia so what are the important clinical features now rapidly progressive bilateral pneumonia often accompanied by pleural effusion and bacteremia so this is considered more severe type of pneumonia because it can quickly go out of the lung okay it can quickly go out of the lung and the pleural effusion which is caused by this pneumonia this is known as para pneumonic effusion para pneumonic effusion so if we if we drain this pleural fluid or tap this pleural fluid and send to the lab what will be the report yes anybody what will be the report of this pleural effusion it is dated exactly dated type very good this is exudative type okay this is a exudative type because it is caused by infection there is no doubt about it so remember all all those lights criteria and everything light criteria can be used in any type of body fluid so uh, that can exactly be used here in staphylococcus aureus we may get certain important clinical feature like rapidly involving respiratory distress this respiratory distress is getting more severe and severe this is a very virulent organism it can quickly lead to pneumococcal this pneumococcal can complicate into lung abscess and this lung abscess can complicate into empyema now empyema means it's a post collection in pleural cavity so that lung abscess may be ruptured and can lead to empyema so these are very serious clinical features of staphylococcus aureus but this question is so important in the exam pneumococcal okay these are small cyst which are filled with air and that that can occur in a scattered way inside the lung remember pneumococcal is a hallmark of staphylococcus aureus pneumonia Now, one important complication of this pneumococcal is they can also lead to pneumothorax okay they can lead to pneumothorax that is presence of air in the pleural cavity and that can lead to collapse of the lung chlamydia trachomatis okay is another bacteria which can cause atypical type of pneumonia now atypical so we already know atypical pneumonia is known as walking pneumonia the signs and symptoms are very different from typical bacterial pneumonia like they have more of dry cough very less or non sputum no fever they continue to do whatever they are doing okay at the same time they have some other feature like conjunctivitis eosinophilia if we examine the cbc and chest x ray shows hyperinflation and diffuse interstitial or patchy opacity now you can call it 
the chest x-ray looks much worse than the patient there are lots of finding inside the x-ray but patient looks fine clinically so this is the feature of chlamydia pneumonia or even mycoplasma pneumonia can have similar type of features okay and these are called walking pneumonia now let's see some of the x-ray see here now so this is chest x-ray okay now look at this area this is the area of consolidation now this is upper lobe okay. this is the area of the middle lobe so this is middle lobe consolidation of the right lung very very typical so most probably the causative organism is pneumococci in this case there is no pleural effusion look at this okay cp angle or costophrenic angle this is very sharp so there is no pleural effusion till now there is no pericardial effusion also because i can see cardiophrenic angle also very clear another case in this chest x ray okay pneumatoceles are shown now look at this arid area okay you can see some dark area there it it looks more blacker than the other area of the lung a more blacker so these are called pneumatocele they can quickly complicate into lung abscess probably they have already complicated into lung abscess if if i look carefully this area okay so here so clearly there is a air fluid level here whenever this type of air fluid level is seen we know there is fluid downwards and air upward so this may be a case of lung abscess already but here probably those type of things are not seen so most probably staph aureus is the causative agent and it has already caused lung abscess in this case now after diagnosing uh, pneumonia uh, let's talk about how to treat it okay what is the treatment so first of all <clears throat> we are working in hospital and how our, our hospitals are full all the time especially these days what is happening see there these days there is a pandemic going on all over the world covid 19 and uh, we healthcare professionals we are saying please stay at home okay stay at home don't come to the hospital until and unless it is really necessary so during this type of situation if we do not have enough bed at hospital or if there is a risky you know thing going on there has to be certain indication for hospitalization we cannot hospitalize any of the cases of pneumonia if we can manage that case at home why to admit in hospital <clears throat> so let's talk about what are the indication for hospitalization if there are features of hypoxia like restlessness anxiety cyanosis inability to sleep or talk or walk or even drink unconsciousness or seizure all of these are features of hypoxia okay especially in the brain or some other parts of the body mainly in the brain these are hypoxic sign and symptom the baby or the child need oxygen and we cannot give oxygen at home so we must admit this baby or child in the hospital give oxygen maintain that oxygen saturation and time and again examine by pulse oximetry so hospital ad, hospitalization is the must if there is reduced urine output or dehydrated child then also hospitalization is the must because we need to give iv fluid if repeated vomiting or poor intake then also we need to admit because parents are very worried how to feed that baby at home okay they probably uh, cannot they are already nervous and presence of high risk factor like children with immunodeficiency disorder children with malnutrition severe malnutrition like grade 3 to grade 4 children with heart failure who got pneumonia on top of that and cystic fibrosis all of these are risk factors so many other you can add here okay so these also should be admitted because uh, quickly the child may deteriorate and die 
So hospitalization is necessary here. Now let's talk about what are the antimicrobials used in pneumonia, okay? And what are the basis for this? How we choose antimicrobials? The antimicrobials are so many and you can choose okay, from a big pool of antibiotic, but there must be some guidelines. There must be some principle. You cannot use whatever you want. So we decide that according to the age and epidemiological data. But remember, if I talk about neonatal age group, the particular bacteria are responsible for the infection, like GBS, E. coli, and Listeria, which are more common than other. So we need to choose certain antibiotic which works against them, isn't it? If you think Staphylococcus aureus is responsible, then you have to choose antibiotic which works against that particular bacteria. You cannot choose any antibiotic. So that is the meaning. And another important point is, which organism is common in that part of the world, in that hospital or in that city? They must have done some research regarding that point. Okay, go to the microbiology lab, try to find out which organisms are common here. This is especially important in hospital acquired type of infection rather than community acquired. Clinical and radiological feature. This is another way to choose the antimicrobial. For example, if you think this is a low bar pneumonia, probably it is caused by pneumococci, so choose antibiotic accordingly like penicillin or amoxicillin. If you think this is a case of atypical pneumonia caused by mycoplasma, which radiological feature will tell you or clinical features will tell you, choose macrolide as the treatment. So this is the meaning. If there are extra pulmonary manifestation, which are very common in tuberculosis, for example, or any other viral or atypical type of organisms, and prevailing drug sensitivity pattern, which drugs are sensitive for that particular organism? Probably the research was already done. So you need to know that as well. So these are very, very important point, not only in pneumonia, in any other disease. Now, how to manage these kids or these uh, children in outpatient ward, okay? Or outpatient department, this is called OPD, management of pneumonia. I already told you, all the children we can't admit in the hospital and this is not necessary also. Okay. So, we need to find them, okay. we need to group them and then treat them from the OPD. So, if clinical features are suggestive of atypical pneumonia, start on macrolide, you don't need to admit them. This is called walking pneumonia, they are managing it. Okay. So give the antibiotic and discharge them and call them for follow-up. Now, macrolide, erythromycin, azithromycin, roxithromycin, these are the group of antibiotic. In other children, <clears throat> quatramoxazole, amoxicillin, or cephalexins can be used. Depends on the causative organism. If pneumococci, maybe I can go for amoxicillin. Normal diet is given. Okay, very important point. Normal diet. These parents, you know, they have so many myths about diet. Uh, they can they can argue for a long time with you. They may ask, doctor, can I give cold food? Can I give hot food? Can I give a little bit, you know, spicy type of food? Can I give meat? Can I give milk? A lot of questions would come from that side. But just say you give normal diet. Don't, you know need to change your diet at this time. You need to give small amount of diet, but multiple time, okay, that is very important. Warning signs should be explained. This point is so important. So what the meaning of that? You all know what I'm talking about here. These are called signs of respiratory distress. So many uh, parents, they don't know about it. So tell them, if your baby or child develops this sign at home, please okay, take them quickly to the hospital. Bring, bring that baby to me or to any hospital or any healthcare center where they can give oxygen or where they can admit the child. Okay? So 
tell them about respiratory distress sign like flaring of the nose okay breathing very difficulty all those things are there call that child again in 48 hour to 72 hour okay and assess the child and then you decide whether your treatment is working well or not is the child condition same or is the child better now do i need to change the antibiotic or do i need to continue the same antibiotic do i need to hospitalize the child or not so all these questions you ask to yourself and decide according to the condition of the child now see here this table is telling us how to differentiate the features of typical and atypical pneumonia typical pneumonia on one side atypical on other and these are the different features so let's talk about that now so see here the onset is sudden in typical pneumonia typical means typical bacterial pneumonia we are talking about which is caused by pneumococci staph aureus haemophilus influenza okay group a beta hemolytic streptococci and those type of organism atypical mycoplasma chlamydia some viruses these are the one now onset is gradual in atypical pneumonia regarding the fever okay see here it is high grade fever in typical bacterial pneumonia in atypical there may be slight amount of fever but usually it is absent usually those children are not febrile regarding the cough it is a productive cough means it is associated with sputum and that is sputum may be yellow okay or it may be tinged with blood which is known as rusty sputum atypical there is no sputum there it is a dry type of cough and this is very dry and irritating cough the child keeps on coughing most of the time even at night the child coughs regarding the symptom many of the typical bacterial pneumonia have pulmonary symptom only until and unless they cause septicemia okay but atypical bacterial pneumonia may have systemic symptoms like headache okay like pharyngitis like bit of arthralgia myalgia those type of things even conjunctivitis regarding the chest x ray the typical bacterial pneumonia has localized you know feature like lobar pneumonia one lobe is affected bronco pneumonia probably in one lung some patches are there in atypical it is mainly diffuse type okay it may be interstitial or diffuse type of pneumonia so these are very important point and don't forget the antibiotic here in typical bacterial pneumonia we can use penicillin and the related antibiotic but in atypical pneumonia you don't use that they they are ineffective there you have to use macrolide group of antibiotic now as a doctor when you admit this child in the hospital what are you going to do inside the hospital or inside the ward isn't it very important question now see here there are two types of treatment we do all the time supportive therapy or symptomatic therapy and specific or definitive therapy now definitive therapy is very easy that is antibiotic according to the causative agent but what are those supportive treatment here oxygen oxygen therapy is given if the child is hypoxic or breathless so most of the children are hypoxic or breathless so oxygen is very important part of the management now how to give oxygen isn't it a bit of practical discussion oxygen can be given by different way one is nasal cannula we insert nasal cannula into the nose and 2 to 3 liter of oxygen can be given very easily through that another is called nasal catheter when a small catheter is inserted in the nose okay not that far away just inside the nose and oxygen is given again 2 to 4 liter can be provided another is a mask okay this is called facial mask of oxygen and a, a bit high flow oxygen can be given but this this is a bit difficult in in a child you know children they don't like to put 
uh, oxygen mask, especially if they are a younger children. They, they throw it away. They don't like it. And one more is the head box. Head box in case of neonate. That head box is very commonly used in the neonatal ward. But remember one thing, uh, if oxygen uh, you know, supply is gone or it is discontinued inside the head box, the baby may die because of carbon dioxide retention there. So we need to be very careful. Good nursing care is very necessary. Good nursing care, a lot of things come here actually. What is the temperature maintenance in that baby? What is the feeding in that baby? Okay. So these all things comes there. For example, if you are giving IV antibiotic through the cannula, if the cannula is already, uh, I mean the vein where you put the cannula is already swollen, the vein is red. Now you need to change the cannula to other place. So all these things are done by the nursing staff. Hydration should be maintained. If the child is vomiting or not drinking properly, good amount of IV fluid should be given. Nutrition. Okay. Mother should be encouraged to give breast milk if the baby is small. If the baby is older, normal diet. Antipyretics. If there is fever, we give paracetamol as antipyretic drug. Physiotherapy of the chest. This is important. If the child is already having some chronic lung disease like bronchiectasis, and on top of that, if pneumonia occurs, okay, that that is sputum or the you know the secretions from the lung should be drained properly. And if heart failure is there, then go for the treatment. So can you tell me what is the treatment of congestive cardiac failure in children? Just one drug. Which is that drug? Diuretic. Diuretic brosamide. Very good. Very good. I already got the answer. Excellent. This is diuretic. And the choice of diuretic is frusemide here. Okay. Just give one shot of frusemide. And if the child is breathless because of heart failure, the child will get better. Now, the second type of uh, treatment here is specific or definitive. This is antimicrobial therapy. And once you have admitted the child in the hospital, mainly you give anti, sorry, intravenous therapy. Okay, intravenous or even intramuscular. Because once you have admitted the, in the hospital, we usually go for uh, you know this intravenous th therapy because they have high bioavailability and uh, the the uh, concentration of the medicine can reach to the blood very easily through iv root now another question how long how long we give a treatment for these babies and how many days they are admitted in the hospital now the common inpatient treatment would last for 10 to 14 days for the atypical organisms 10 days may be enough and one important exception is staphylococcal pneumonia. We may need to give for three to four weeks. This is a quite a long time because this staphylococcus aureus can cause a lot of complication in the body. It can lead to empyema very easily. It, it can lead to lung abscess very easily. And it can go out of the lung and uh, affect so many other organs also, like bone, osteomyelitis. Okay? Even meningitis can be caused. That's why to cover this well, a longer duration is necessary. But this is not an absolute point. So we can always you know, decide accordingly in each and every patient. Some patient may need only 10 to 14 days, for example. Some other may need for a longer time. And regarding the outpatient department treatment, uh, five to seven days would be enough. Now we have come towards the end of this topic. What are the complications of pneumonia? What can happen to that child as a complication? The complications can be divided into local and systemic. Now, local means in that area, what complications can occur? Now, see here. Now these are the local complications. Plural effusion or impaima, very common complications of pneumonia. And this is exudative type of pleural effusion. And another term is called para-pneumonic effusion. Para-pneumonic effusion, very commonly used term. 
impaima is post collection in the pleural cavity sometime the same para pneumonic effusion may complicate into impaima now one small information i like to share with you here see here now what we do to diagnose this condition we go for pleural tap okay we go for pleural tapping and we analyze the pleural fluid so pleural fluid analysis is done and in that pleural fluid analysis if ph okay if ph is less than 7.2 pH is less than 7.2. Okay, one minute. Sorry. pH is less than 7.2. Then it strongly shows that this is a case of impaima. Sometimes the frank pus may not be there. Okay, it is going towards the pus formation. So remember this one very important point. If pH is less than 7.2 in that pleural fluid, it is already a case of impaima, and I have to drain it now with the help of chest tube drainage. Another uh, complication, or the local complication, can be collapse, okay, atelectasis. Another may be pneumothorax. Already told, it is very common in staphylococcal pneumonia where there is pneumatocele, okay. Pneumatocele formation, and this pneumothorax also has to be treated well, otherwise, uh, it can lead to hypoxia and even can cause the death. Lung abscess and bronchiectasis. Now, bronchiectasis can occur in severe necrotizing type of pneumonia. This is one of the complications. Again, staphylococcal pneumonia can uh, you know complicate into bronchiectasis, and lung abscess means localized collection of pus inside the lung which is also very commonly seen as a complication of severe type of pneumonia. Now, subcutaneous emphysema. This is leakage of the air, okay? Leakage of the air into the subcutaneous space. Into the subcutaneous space. Now, how to examine, or sorry, how to how to diagnose this subcutaneous emphysema? Anybody? How to diagnose it? Yes? Diagnosis, okay, is uh, done by examination itself. When you examine this subcutaneous emphysema area, there is typical feeling, which is called egg crackling sensation. Egg crackling sensation because the air is present in that subcutaneous area and we can feel feel it and another is x-ray if we do x-ray the collection of the air can be seen there it looks like a bit black area there regarding the systemic uh, complications of uh, pneumonia these are very easy term for you sepsis okay sepsis is one of them sorry let me underline it and explain to you sepsis okay or septicemia it is one of the common cause of septicemia and from that uh, septicemia it can go to other organ meningitis it can lead to meningitis it can lead to septic arthritis this is a pyogenic infection of the joint osteomyelitis infection of the bone and peritonitis okay these all are very very important uh, complications of uh, pneumonia so, so many bacterial infections I've been talking about hematogenous uh, root of spread or hematogenous way of spread. See here, these are the different, you know, source of infection in our body. Any of these infection, ultimately it can involve the blood, which is called bacteremia in the beginning. And later on, sepsis or septicemia can happen easily and then it can go anywhere to other organ. Okay, so this is the end of the topic. Uh, at the end, there are these, these are the questions. I'm sure uh, you can solve them.